it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, John Levy Barnard, um, who is our keynote this morning. John Levy Barnard is Associate Professor in American Studies and Environmental Humanities at Univers University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And he's invited professor uh, for two weeks at LARCA, the Research uh, Laboratory in Humanities and Social Sciences of the English-Speaking World at Université de Paris. John Levy Barnard specializes in American literature before 1900 and um, the environmental humanities. Uh, he has been awarded many prestigious prizes and fellowships, uh, lately the National Humanities Center Fellowship. And he is the author of many research articles, among which um, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention two of them, The Cod and the Whale, Melville in the Time of Extinction in American Literature in 2017, and more recently, the bison and the cow, I think bison is a kind of key word of this conference. So um, the bison and the cow, food empire extinction in American quarterly in 2020. The book he is currently working on is uh, provisionally entitled The Edible and the Endangered Food Empire Extinction. And I think this talk today is drawn from the fourth chapter, uh, which focuses on the emergence of industrial meat production and fast food as pillars of the U.S. economy and food culture uh, of the long 20th century. John Levy Barnard's interdisciplinary approach is of special interest today um, as we're trying to reassess our literary methods and our practices uh, in a moment of emergency when climate change invite us, invites us to rethink um, the disciplinary divide that we inherited largely from the 19th century. Um, his global approach to national literatures um, is also important um, to help us re-examine national essentialisms at a time again, when we're all, if inequally, impacted by climate change and what some have called the capital scene. So the, the title of his talk today is Meet Climate and the dystopia of the present. Uh, let me add that John Levy Barnard will also give a paper um, at the Environmental Humanities Seminar at LARCA uh, this Wednesday, um, this coming Wednesday. Um, and the title of his talk will be American Literature and the Planet on Fire. But today, meet climate and the dystopia of the present. So once again, thank you for uh, John Levy for sharing your work with us today. Um, John Levy has a uh, kindly agree to answer questions after his talk. So um, there will be probably a hope questions from the audience here and maybe also Zoom questions that I will be taking as well. So thank you and the stage is yours. Okay. Well, he hello to everybody. Thank you, um, Cecile, for both inviting me um, here and uh, for that very uh, generous introduction. Thank you also to uh, Marion Magnon and Samantha Wachter uh, for their help in putting this together. And thanks to uh, Paul Henri Giraud, the Institut des Amériques, and to all of you for coming and for everybody who's uh, joining on Zoom. So I would like to start with just a few um, images. Um, And um, these may be uh, familiar from, from the extremely bad news about uh, climate in the last couple of years. This is um, uh, San Francisco in California last year. This is in uh, Greece, uh, in Evia in Greece, just this August. This is New York City a couple of weeks ago. Um, so these kinds of images are the stuff that we normally associate with uh, something like speculative fiction or science fiction films. Um, and indeed, uh, many people have uh, commented when these pictures came out of San Francisco that uh, during the wildfires, the, the city uncannily sort of resembled the dystopian um, setting in Blade Runner 2049. If any of you have seen that movie from 2017, the film seemed to anticipate the kind of climate situation that actually would materialize just a couple of years later. Um, so although these look like science fiction images, um, these are just uh, 
these floods and fires are what climate change looks like right now, not in the future. And that climate change is driven, as we know, largely by fossil fuel consumption, but it is also driven by a meat industry that is responsible for 15 to 20 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions and is the leading driver of species extinctions worldwide. Despite its implication in climate change and an array of ecological and economic injustices, the global meat industry has yet to become a major concern for scholars in the environmental humanities. This is compared, for example, with their interest in oil, coal, and energy production, or toxicity and disaster, major disasters like the Bhopal, the Union Carbide uh, explosion in Bhopal, India, or the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil rig platform in the Gulf of Mexico. And despite the ever intensifying climate emergency and increasing public awareness of the planetary impacts of meat production, to say nothing of meat industry's role uh, as an incubator of potentially pandemic diseases, the average US consumer still consumes over 200 pounds of meat every year. And there remains a sense that cheap and abundant meat, like just like cheap and abundant gasoline, is not merely desirable, but essential to both material existence and national identity in the United States. And this is a, this is a, a graph of um, kind of meat consumption worldwide. The dark blue countries are the, the heaviest consumption. You can see the USA is a, is a major outlier um, out to the top, but of course other countries uh, here in Europe, you can see France uh, there and Italy and Germany are, are, are up there. And, and of course, Brazil and um, and Argentina are also countries that consume quite a lot of meat, although per capita, the US is very much an outlier. Um, so as, uh, as Stephanie Lemonager and others in the environmental humanities have done with American petroleum culture, in this talk, I'll try to sketch out the cultural history and the ecological ramifications of meat culture. I will look specifically at the interrelated infrastructures. Sorry, we're not there yet. <laughs> uh, at the interrelated infrastructures of meat production and consumption, the slaughterhouse and the fast food franchise, as they have figured in both the physical landscape and the cultural imagination of the United States. I'll start with two examples that highlight the ways meat has become central to American identity and narratives of American progress. The first of these is John Lee Hancock's film, The Founder. It's a 2017 biopic of the McDonald's uh, tycoon, Ray Kroc, who is played by Michael Keaton. Um, and uh, the second is David Foster Wallace's story, Westward, The Course of Empire Takes Its Way. This is from the 1989 collection, uh, Girl with Curious Hair. And this story is also about McDonald's. Um, I'll then turn to some texts and films that warn of the precariousness of that abundant supply of, of meat. These works imagine meat's scarcity as a defining feature of a dystopian future, but in their focus on the future, they generally fail to register how the dystopia of the present, marked by climate disasters and the ever-increasing risk of zoonotic pandemic disease, is in large part a product of its very abundance. What these alternating visions of abundance and scarcity reveal is a consuming culture that now appears simultaneously essential and entirely unsustainable, a conundrum that offers a specific iteration of what has become a general truism for critics of late capitalism, that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the, end of cap than the, than the world without meat. <laughs> but in my conclusion, I'll try to offer a way of imagining that world anyway. And in the two objectives of the talk, one historical, the other speculative, I hope to model a method for environmental humanities within the context of American studies, taking a long historical view of the crises of the present, and then using the present not to project the shape of the inevitable dystopia to come, but to discern within that present the possible shape of a better future. Though the meat industry as we know it emerged in the decades after the US Civil War, it developed within a deeper historical context of colonization. Livestock grazing and meat production are examples of what the Potawatomi scholar Kyle Powis White calls industrial settler campaigns. 
These include large scale mineral and fossil fuel extraction and sweeping landscape transforming regimes of commodity agriculture, which have developed into a petroleum energy regime and an industrial food system that together have profoundly shaped American life and culture and radically disrupted the atmospheric and ecosystemic orders upon which all life is dependent. As White has argued, settler campaigns have long since rendered the Americas a dystopia from the perspective of its indigenous people. But from a settler perspective, those campaigns have constituted the very essence of progress. This view of expropriation and disruption as progress is evident through US literary and historical writing of the 19th century. Frederick Jackson Turner made it especially clear in his, uh, in his um, talk, the significance of the frontier in American history. Turner initially delivered this frontier thesis as a lecture at the 1893 meeting of the American Historical Association, which was held in Chicago to coincide with the Columbian Exposition, a world's fair celebrating the 400 years of civilizational progress since the arrival of Columbus in the new world. Turner narrates that progress through a series of infrastructural transformations from the Buffalo Trail to the Indian Trail and then the Trader's Trace. The trails widened into roads and turnpikes, and these in turn were transformed into railroads. Turner concludes his infrastructural sequence with the railroad, but what's missing is the emergent meat industry that would be the first to fully capitalize on the railroad's potential. Just across town from the Columbian Exposition, the slaughter and packing houses of Chicago had become tourist attractions in their own right. And if you can believe this, this is a promotional postcard that um, the Swift uh, meatpacking company would give out to people as a way of promoting tourism to come to these uh, uh, kind of horrifying industrial meatpacking uh, facilities. And, and people would actually tour these different um, uh, facilities. This is a, a, another card that actually illustrates the Swift and Company exhibition at the World's Fair at the Columbian Exhibition. So you can see it's like a looks like a Greek temple with um, uh, animal carcasses hanging inside of it and a, and a cow on top of a big, uh, you know, column there and, the, you know, well-heeled bourgeois tourists walking around and admiring the product. So, um, okay. so what drew these, these tourists, like the ones that you can see in the card, primarily were the astonishing speed and efficiency of the plant's operations, characteristics that made them what the historian Dominic Pasiga calls a spectacle of the modern. This efficiency was certainly what attracted Henry Ford, who would later model his assembly line production of automobiles on the disassembly of animal bodies he witnessed in Chicago. Ford's factory system would in turn inspire the McDonald's brothers to devise what they called the speedy system of fast food service. From these beginnings, infrastructures of industrial meat and individual auto mobility developed together across the 20th century to transform the United States into what Eric Schlosser has called a fast food nation. The proliferation of fast food franchises initially coincided with the spread of interstate highways across the country. And these highways and franchises might easily be appended to Turner's narrative of infrastructural progress. This continuity is suggested by a scene in The Founder in which Ray Kroc's eventual fast food empire begins with an impromptu road trip along what would become known as historic Route 66. He drives out to meet the McDonald brothers at their original restaurant in San Bernardino, California. The scene not only emphasizes the relation between fast food and automobile culture, but also figures Kroc's business venture as a form of pioneering that echoes the westward trajectory of US imperial expansion. The film goes on to intensify this alignment of Kroc's enterprise with the idea of manifest destiny and a normative conception of Americanness, one characterized by both absolute freedom of movement and a divinely sanctioned mission to settle and improve the landscape. In making his pitch to the McDonald brothers to open franchises nationwide, Kroc appeals to this sense of national identity and purpose. Do it for your country, he says, do it for America. He goes on to develop his appeal through a pair of related symbols he has encountered in his years as a traveling salesman. In every town, he says, 
There's a church and a courthouse, the one emblematized by a cross, the other by an American flag. And he imagines the golden arches joining these as a third term in the trinity of a new national religion. Crosses, flags, arches. McDonald's, he concludes, can be the new American church. Crack's speech encapsulates the powerful synergy of national ideology and consumer culture as they crystallize in the world's most recognizable corporate logo. Those golden arches stand in for a larger campaign of architecture, signage, and advertising that promise not only cheap, predictable, and satisfying food, but also a place for friends and families to celebrate communal tastes and values. What David Foster Wallace will call in his story, Westward, the Course of Empire Takes Its Way, the world community's true and total restaurant. These signs, structures, and advertisements contribute to a strategy of hyper-visibility that emphasizes the accessibility and aesthetic appeal of the company's products. Wallace's story, which I want to think about here as a prescient vision of the relation of meat and specifically fast food to the climate catastrophe, and it's written in 1989, so you know, I, I mean that it's, it is kind of tapping into something at an early point in the discourse. Um, uh, so this story takes this commitment, the McDonald's commitment to visibility through advertising as its present, as its premise. The driving force of the narrative in the story is not Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, but a fictional advertising executive named J.D. Steelritter, who is trying to produce what he calls the ultimate McDonald's commercial. That commercial will feature the reunion of everyone who has ever appeared in a McDonald's commercial before. And this ultimate commercial will strike the consuming public, as Steel Ritter imagines it, with the force of a revelation, capturing a crowded and final transfiguration that will represent and so transmit a pan-global desire for meat. Wallace's story looks both forward to an apocalyptic culmination of the nation's manifest destiny and back to the literary origins of that very idea. The title refers to George Berkeley's uh, the 1726 poem, Verses on the Prospect of Planting Arts and Learning in America. It's a British imperial poem that I can talk about more in the Q&A if you'd like. But the story's setting and its subject fits in with the 19th century tradition I mentioned by way of Turner's frontier thesis. An important earlier text in that tradition is William Cullen Bryant's 1833 poem, The Prairies, which is set precisely where Wallace's story is set in central Illinois. In that poem, Bryant figures the Illinois prairie, prairie as a terra nullius, empty land awaiting the advancing multitude which soon shall fill these deserts. If Bryant's poem anticipates Turner's procession of civilization from the fur trader and hunter to the cattle raiser and the pioneer farmer, Wallace's story picks up the sequence where Turner leaves off narrating the transformation of that same landscape from a patchwork of small family farms into the foundation of the industrial food system. And Wallace links this transformation to the emergence of a whole set of normative ideas about middle-class life in the 20th century United States, a form of life enabled equally by the industrialized cornfields of the American heartland and the petroleum complex that fuels the cars and paves the roads that traverse it. These threads of food, fuel, and normative American family life quite literally converge in Wallace's story in the fictional town of Collision, Illinois, home to the world headquarters of Steel Ritter Advertising, where the ultimate McDonald's commercial is to be produced. The town gets its name from the occasion of its founding, sometime during the Depression, when a wealthy Chicago woman in a big touring car and a farmer on a small tractor collided at an intersection of country roads running through the cornfields of central Illinois. Almost literalizing the impact of industrial capital on agrarian life, the wealthy woman's car kills the farmer and her money finances the transformation of his farm. Traumatized and overcome with guilt, the woman decides never to leave the site of the accident and to pay the farmer's family more than the farmer himself would have brought in a lifetime. The farmer in the imagined history of this story is Ray Kroc Sr. And his son is going to be Ray Kroc, who will go on to found McDonald's. And his son, now out from underneath his hardworking father's shadow, discovered that he had vision. 
That vision leads him to engineer an innovative rotation on their farm, shifting the emphasis of their labor and capital in the direction of cattle, potatoes, and sugar, the pillars of the fast food industry he would go on to pioneer. Across the road from the Kroc family farm, the wealthy woman settles down and marries an itinerant peddler named Steel Ritter, who establishes a booming business in rose bushes and raises a son named JD, who will go on to found the global advertising agency that bears his name and that will do all the advertising for McDonald's. As home to both the fictional JD Steel Ritter and the counterfactual Ray Kroc, the town of Collision is both the site at which the image and perception of McDonald's franchise empire is controlled and the point of origin of that empire itself. None of this stuff in the story about Ray Kroc is true, except for his visionary sense of the potential of cows, potatoes, and sugar to transform the foodscape of the United States and eventually the world. Kroc was born in Illinois, but in Oak Park, which is just outside of Chicago, and never lived on a farm. Wallace invents a mythic backstory for Kroc um, that projects, uh, that would resonate ultimately with the wholesome vision that Kroc projects for himself in his, in his pitch to the McDonald's brothers in the movie, The Founder. Though in real life, Kroc ruthlessly co-opted the McDonald brothers um, and, their, and their business, uh, Wallace's crock and the idea of McDonald's spring from the soil of the heartland itself. The original sons of Collision, Illinois, Croc and Steel Ritter come up together, pioneering the production of fast food and television advertising. As Croc built the McDonald's empire, Steel Ritter, as Wallace writes, was building Ray Croc into a myth. And the creation of this Croc myth in Wallace's story reflects a larger real world mythology that has developed around the entire industrial food system. One that is shot through with something like Renato Rizzoldo's notion of imperialist nostalgia for the economies and ecosystems that empire itself disrupts. And this is just the website for Hillshire Farms, which is one of the major food producers in the, in the, in the US. And, and you can see that the advertising like makes it look like your food is coming from a small farmer who works on a small farm in a nice red barn and it's all very, uh, uh, wholesome and it's from the country and the heartland and so on and that's all nonsense um, so this is all marketing and this includes everything from in marketing for example industrial dairy uh, as the work of small farmers and happy cows to the framing of McDonald's as a kind of a, as a family restaurant and this Hillshire Farms is kind of just an example of that imagery um, as Kroc's sermon on the Golden Arches in The Founder makes clear, the fast food industry aims to cultivate this mythology through not only spectacular imagery of the sort Steel Ritter produces, but also the charismatic and appealing nature of its actual restaurant locations. But if the industry's success depends upon the allure of these visible images and infrastructures of consumption, it also relies on the relative invisibility of production. So while in the early days of the industry, major producers like Swift endeavor to present their, their operations as a spectacle of the modern, drawing tourists to actually come and witness it. Um, that spectacle could never quite be separated from what Pesiga calls the smell of the modern, the stench of barbarity that accompanied the evidence of progress. Given the gruesome nature of the sights, sounds, and smells of slaughter, it is not surprising that in the century since the heyday of the Chicago stockyards, Meat production has shifted from a promotional spectacle in the middle of a major city to a fiercely guarded secret governed by what uh, Timothy Pashirat calls a logic of distancing and concealment. Central to this concealment has been the infrastructural shift from rail networks and major cities like Chicago to the highways and diesel trucks that facilitated the movement of meatpacking plants from major urban centers to more remote locations where a handful of enormous plants produce a vast majority of America's meat while also exporting vast quantities to the rest of the world. And this is the Tyson meat, Tyson owns Hillshire Farms. So that out of Hillshire Farms, like that product is made in that building, right? Not in that red barn. And um, this was the site, this is one of, this is Tyson's largest meatpacking plant. It's in Iowa. And it was the site of a huge outbreak of COVID-19 last year in, in March and April. It actually had to shut down because of the, uh, because of the outbreak. Industrial slaughter has thus been rendered invisible by geography and design, 
while also being silenced by an array of ag-gag laws intended to prevent whistleblowers, activists, and journalists from exposing its realities to the public. And what the industry now conceals are not only its appalling labor conditions and the quotidian violence of production, but also its ecological impacts. Um, the meat industry is a major emitter of greenhouse gases from methane released from the stomachs of cows to the destruction of rainforest to make way for grazing and large scale corn and soy cultivation for animal feed. And this, this slide here is just one example of many stories like this that have come out recently. And, you know, I mean, larger than the, than the, the carbon footprints of like whole countries, okay? So the links between meat, rainforests and climate change were made strikingly visible in 2019 when fires raging through the Amazon made global headlines. Images of the burning rainforest resonated with images of other wildfires around the world from Australia to the Arctic. But the Amazon fires were neither natural nor, nor accidental. They were part of a concerted effort by agribusiness to transform the rainforest into cropland and cattle ranches. And this has only gotten worse in the last couple of years um, the, in terms of the fires in the, in the Amazon. Um, because of the deliberate destruction of habitat by agribusiness and increasingly devastating effects of ongoing global warming, many scientists now fear that the Amazon may be approaching a tipping point, at which point the ecosystem will collapse, transforming from one of the world's largest carbon sinks, what some more poetically describe as the lungs of the planet, into a net emitter of carbon. As with collapsing ice sheets and melting permafrost, this would create a feedback loop where the effects of warming create more warming. But this potentially apocalyptic outcome should be understood not as a novel, as an entirely new phenomenon, but rather as part of what Kyle Powis White has called the ongoing dystopia of industrial settler campaigns in the Americas and evidence of capitalism's imperial drive to create markets and, and export desire for whatever it extracts and produces. In this case, a pan-global desire for meat that can only be satisfied at the cost of the planet itself. Okay. Um, Wallace's story was published in 1989 when climate change was only just entering into public discourse, but it does re register an inchoate awareness of global warming as a threat, looming in abstract but potentially catastrophic. This awareness is made explicit through a survey that the Steel Ritter Advertising Company is conducting with arriving passengers at the Central Illinois Regional Airport, which is incidentally the airport, actual airport where I caught the plane to come here. Um, that's the plane that we took. Um, a researcher at this airport offers each passenger a dollar bill in exchange for sharing right off the top of their head what they fear most in the world. People in response to this survey report fears ranging from discomfort and the dark to Russian bomb, nuclear winter and apocalypse. But at least one person reports a fear of the greenhouse effect. With these references to nuclear war and climate change lingering behind Steel Ritter's weirdly eschatological vision of the ultimate advertisement, not only the best commercial, but the last one, the story certainly has something apocalyptic about it. Wallace does not explicitly connect the dots between fossil fuels, meat production, and global warming, yet oil and meat are the central ingredients in the apocalyptic scenario of the story. The promised end of that scenario is the ultimate McDonald's commercial, which Steelbritter imagines is something akin to a biblical revelation. And that revelation will take place literally and figuratively under the quasi-religious, ubiquitously recognizable sign of the golden arches. For the reunion commercial, Steel Ritter has constructed twin arches of plated gold, each the size of the St. Louis Gateway Arch. These giant arches are visible in the distance as the final group of actors heading for the commercial, the main, these are the main characters in the story, make their way from the airport to the advertising agency where the commercial is supposed to take place. But the characters never arrive at their destination. The story, the action of the story consists of entirely of different modes of transit and travel, each one subject to different kinds of deferral and delay. While meat is the story's thematic focus, what is consumed most of all in the story is fossil fuel. The actors travel by airplane from Baltimore to Chicago before moving on to the Central Illinois Airport via a helicopter shuttle service 
Steel Ritter and his son, uh, who's named DeHaven, pick up the actors in DeHaven's car. His car is an American car. It's made in Detroit. It has a Detroit engine and a broken ignition that forces DeHaven to keep it running all the time. It is, as DeHaven says, a motherfucker on gas, but the car's bottomless demand for oil also illuminates the contingency of everything else in the story and in the modern world it depicts on oil as well. Wallace's story registers petroleum centrality, not only in DeHaven's car, but in a cylindrical fuel truck that passes them along the road with its big silver tube of a rig wobbling from side to side with red signs advocating flammable, flammable caution. And this truck is part of a larger influx of fuel trucks, chicken trucks, Coke trucks, and meat trucks, all arriving to supply the thousands of actors who are arriving here to participate in this reunion commercial itself. Though the narrator promises that they will eventually reach their destination and realize the apocalyptic promise of the ultimate commercial, we're left at the, end of the, at the end of the story with the car stuck in the mud on the side of the road, spinning its wheels, the accelerator pushed flat and the big car's engine screaming. The carbon footprint of what's happening in this story is enormous. From the helicopter shuttle to the spinning wheels of the car going nowhere, both of which remind us not only of the total lack in middle America of more sensible infrastructures like passenger rail lines, but also the ideological determination to remain automobile, to always be driving all the time, pushing that accelerator flat, regardless of where it may be driving us after all. But what's perhaps less obvious and but equally important is the way the story situates neoliberal consumerism within the history and the geography of empire and recognizes the centrality of meat to all of it. If in the age of climate change, we can no longer see that car or that helicopter in that story without also registering their carbon dioxide emissions, neither should we imagine a pan-global desire for meat satisfied by the world community's total restaurant without acknowledging the fossil fuel inputs to the food, as well as the greenhouse gases from meat truck exhaust and burning rainforest to the methane gas spewed from the bellies of cows that are always invisibly accumulating in the atmosphere. Wallace's story appeared at the time global warming was only beginning to enter into mainstream conversation. And if it doesn't explicitly acknowledge their actual atmospheric implications, it nonetheless registers the ascendancy of meat and petroleum cultures that are primary contributors to what must be regarded as a climate of emergency. And if these cultures of petroleum and animal consumption um, must also be regarded as elements of an imperial history, traceable from Bryant and Turner to Wallace, the genocidal and ecocidal ramifications of this history are legible in indigenous accounts like those of Kyle Powis White, which frame industrialization and petroleum fueled modernity as part of a continuous emergency unfolding since the arrival of European colonizers in the Americas, just as these things are legible also in the atmospheric record. The initial phase of colonial warfare and disease destroyed whole societies and left tens of millions dead, a catastrophe that left its mark not only on the earth, but in the atmosphere, as the reduction in agriculture and other human activity resulted in a significant decline in greenhouse gas concentrations. Carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases have been rising uh, ever since, driven in large part by fossil fuel extraction and an ever-expanding system of cattle, cattle production, where narratives of manifest destiny tell a progressive story of expanding freedom and the spread of civilization. What the atmosphere affirms is the historical perspective of scholars like Kyle White, which apprehends Turner's procession of civilization as a dystopian nightmare culminating in an apocalyptic threat to the very civilization that produced it. And this is a, just a, a the graph. If you look at the graph on the top, there's, you can see there's a very sharp dip in um, uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere that occurs over the period from the, the turn of the uh, 16th century, just after the arrival of Columbus, to a, a very a, a, a low point at 1610, about a, just over 100 years later. And then the carbon uh, dioxide concentration goes you know, in a familiar graph that we're all familiar with. It rises very sharply in the centuries following colonization. Um, okay. 
So if Wallace's story registers something dystopian, if not apocalyptic about US meat culture and the present, I want to turn now to speculative fictions and films that figure meat's scarcity as central to, this, to the dystopian futures they imagine. Consider, for example, The Matrix. In that film, a band of insurgents fight to liberate the human species from their enslavement to an artificial intelligence that humans have themselves created. The artificial intelligence regime controls enslaved human bodies that are, which are literally grown and exploited as an energy source until they die and are liquefied to be fed to the living. By plugging their minds into a virtual, virtual reality called the matrix, which provides every individual with a perfect simulation of late capitalist life. The enslaved thus live in a state of total deception, believing in their reality and their agency within it. Those who manage to free themselves do so at the cost of exchanging the comforting deception of the matrix for the grim reality of the post-apocalyptic world. Among the many drawbacks of this post-apocalyptic reality is the food. The insurgents uh, subsist entirely on some kind of manufactured gruel consisting of single cell protein combined with synthetic aminos, vitamins, and minerals, which has everything the body needs, but none of what it wants. This unappetizing breakfast is in stark contrast to a dinner scene that immediately precedes it, in which an agent of the AI regime convinces an, an insurgent to betray the cause. Set within the simulated reality of the matrix, the agent named Smith and the insurgent named Cypher negotiate over a steak, red wine, and cigars, which Cypher savors with the affect of a person just returned from a desert island. Cutting a substantial bite from the steak on his plate, Cypher lingers over the meat on the fork. I know this steak isn't real, he says. It is just the coating of the matrix telling him it is juicy and delicious. But after years of misery and tasteless gruel, he just doesn't care. Ignorance is bliss, he says, before agreeing to sell out not only his friends but the future of humanity, in exchange for a return to a life in a world that his stake seems to embody. We can track this sense of a dystopian future as essentially meatless across a number of novels and films. Among the most striking in recent memory is the Argentine writer Agustina Basterica's novel, Cadaver Exquisito, translated to English as tender as the flesh, uh, which allegorizes the meat industry through a dystopian future in which animals are scarce, uh, this is following a, 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 a panzootic, an animal version of a pandemic that kills all the, all the food animals. And human beings are raised and slaughtered as livestock. Similarly, in Mar uh, Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Craig, even before a genetically engineered virus wipes out the human population in an apocalyptic pandemic, the world has become a dystopia characterized by a scarcity of meat. In the degraded foodscape of Atwood's imagined future, most animal products have been replaced by soy substitutes like crusté soy imitation shrimp and soy oh boy sardines, burgers and wieners. In this dystopia, real animal foods are reserved for the extremely privileged classes who live in walled compounds of the technology corporations that dominate the economy. Inside th these compounds, the character Craig, who is a genetic scientist who, in who engineers the deadly virus that kills everybody, treats his friend Snowman to an array of real foods, which are rare as diamonds, from real oysters and real Japanese beef to a French brie with a label that appeared authentic. Atwood here creates a sharp contrast between real and artificial foods. Meats and cheeses stand in for the real, while soy is figured as the very essence of the fake. This odd notion of soy, a legume that has been cultivated for thousands of years, um, as inherently artificial is a commonplace of meat eating discourse. But the cultural touchstone for that idea is definitely the 1973 film Soylent Green. Like Oryx and Crake, Soylent Green is set in a degraded future where real food is scarce and the people subsist on various forms of tasteless, odorless crud manufactured by the Soylent Corporation. Soylent's signature product comes in a variety of colors. Soylent red and yellow consists of high energy vegetable concentrate, while delicious Soylent green is the miracle food made from high energy plankton gathered from the oceans of the world. The red and yellow varieties are depicted as less de desirable because they are more artificial. In a scene in a crowded marketplace, shots of a vendor 
packing soylent yellow or interspersed with others, selling plastic wear and synthetic footgear, drawing these disparate commodities together through their artificiality. Soylent green, by contrast, is in high demand. And the implication is that it is better not only because it is harvested from the oceans and therefore more natural, but it is also because it is meat made, from the, made at first from the animal bodies of plankton and later, as the film famously reveals in its conclusion, out of people. Sorry for the spoiler. Um, like the novel on which it is based, Harry Harrison's Make Room, Make Room, Soylent Green is a generic hybrid of a speculative dystopia and hard-boiled detective fiction. But only the film links the crime under investigation directly to the degraded food system that is the most notable feature of the imagined dystopian future in both the novel and the film. While in the film, while in the novel, sorry, the murder victim is mixed up in a web of organized crime and political corruption. In the film, the victim is an executive with the Soylent Corporation, murdered to prevent him from disclosing what he knows that through pollution over harvesting and climate change that the oceans are dying and with them the plankton that Soylent harvests for Soylent Green. Faced with this dwindling supply of its primary resource, Soylent pivots to the one thing this dystopian future has in abundance, which is human bodies. In, a, in alignment with a long tradition of the literature of colonization, going back at least to Robinson Crusoe, Cannibalism is figured here as the ultimate horror, which drives those who discover it to madness and suicide. But even prior to the revelation that Soylent Green is people, the film suggests that even a non-cannibalistic food system dominated by tasteless soy-based crud would be bad enough. As in the dystopian futures of Orcs and Crake and the Matrix in the world of Soylent Green, the people can get what the body needs, but not what it desires. There is stuff to eat, but nothing that qualifies as food. An older character named Saul, who's played by Edward G. Robinson, who is the roommate of the police detective protagonist played by Charlton Heston, recalls better days when food was food and you could buy meat anywhere. Eggs they had, he tells Thorne, and real butter. Saul focuses his recollection on animal foods. And when Thorne later surprises him with a slab of beef, that he has extra legally confiscated from the crime scene at the apartment of the dead Soylent executive. And it's worth noting that the Soylent executive has been murdered with a meat hook. Um, Saul, when he sees this, he literally bursts into, into tears. As with the stake in the matrix, the beef here stands in for a way of life that has been lost. After his initial emotional breakdown at the sight of it, Saul prepares the beef into a stew and he and Thorne share a meal that provides more than a, the aesthetic pleasure of real food. It provides a momentary return to a world in which such things were ready, readily available to everyone. This is them enjoying their, their meal together. The deprivations of the future are reinforced by this nostalgia for the past. Nostalgia is Saul's prevailing sentiment throughout the film right up until he enters the assisted suicide clinic, which administers lethal medication while streaming images of wild animals in landscapes of pristine nature. So that's Saul lying in his assisted suicide bed, looking at a projection of these um, uh, wild animals frolicking on the screen. If those images represent an imperialist nostalgia for an ecological order that colonial capitalist industrialization is itself responsible for destroying, the beef stew that Saul and Thorne share embodies their nostalgia for the pleasures of that industrialization, specifically of a food system that allowed consumers to buy meat anywhere at a price that anyone could afford. For viewers of Soylent Green, of course, this registers as a nostalgia for the present. The late capitalist time and place David Foster Wallace describes in his story, where the average US consumer can eat 200 pounds of meat every year and McDonald's can boast of the billions and billions of hamburgers that it has served. I wanna close this talk by returning to that present through a less obviously dystopian image than those with which I began. This is Canadian photographer, Edward Bertinsky's picture of Breezewood, Pennsylvania. And I'd like to use this image to affect a conceptual turn from dystopian 
reality to utopian possibility. The photo is part of a series that documents the life cycle, life cycle of petroleum from tar sands and oil fields to superhighways and racetracks, and finally to the graveyards of retired military aircraft and worn out tires. Compared to the deliberately unsettling images of rusting planes, burning tires, and other scenes of catastrophic environmental uh, damage, Breezewood is notable for its banality. As opposed to horrifying scenes of extraction and waste, Breezewood captures a quarter mile stretch of road leading up to a highway interchange. In the context of the oil series, the viewer might be drawn to the five gas stations that are visible in the frame. And you could just see them all lined, lined up there in a row. Um, but there are also no fewer than eight fast food restaurants in this picture. An Exxon station appears most prominent in the foreground, and it has the tallest sign there right in the middle, and the, the, the station is, is in the closest to you, closest to the viewer. Um, but the single largest and most recognizable corporate icon is McDonald's as the golden arches tower over a Denny's, a Quiznos, and a Pizza Hut nearby. The photo is a quintessential scene of quotidian consumption in the United States. This could be anywhere in America. Um, but this picture of the ordinary, as the other images in the series remind us, is bolstered by the extraordinary infrastructures of, and networks of production and distribution that constitute the meat and petroleum industries. As with the cars, planes, helicopters, and delivery trucks in Wallace's story, the carbon footprint here is enormous. And while the brightly colored corporate logos signal the ready availability of the comforts and conveniences of American modernity, in the context of the oil series, it is difficult not to see the dystopian features of this world as well. But if the scene at Breezewood is inextricable from the larger dystopia, one that has been unfolding not merely since 19th century industrialization, but through the far longer history of colonial capitalism in the Americas, I want to conclude by reconsidering this dystopia through what Frederick Jameson has called utopia as method. Rather than representing an imagined utopia of the future, this method consists of detective work in the present, a reading of utopian clues and traces in the landscape of the real. Utopia as method is a willful and prodigious effort to change the valences of even the most noxious phenomena to deliberately and experimentally declare positive things that are clearly negative in our world, to affirm that dystopia is in reality utopia if examined more closely, to isolate specific features in our empirical present so as to read them as components of a different system. An example that he offers is Walmart, a phenomenon most left-leaning critics would identify as especially noxious, Jobs at Walmart scarcely pay a living wage and offer no benefits. While its ruthless business practices allow the retailer to exercise what Jameson calls a reign of terror over its suppliers, while, it's, um, while destroying whole ecologies and whole communities. But if Walmart's devastating power as a retail monopoly renders conditions for both workers and environments dystopian in the extreme, Jameson is also quick to note that this power could be exercised in exactly the opposite way, not to reduce the quality of materials and product, but to impose ecological standards on producers and to demand safe conditions and fair pay for workers throughout their supply chains. This vision of Walmart's potentially positive dictatorship, these are all Jameson's phrases, as opposed to the negative one that now prevails, is a utopian vision according to Jameson's method to the degree to which the valences of this power from retail monopoly to the various producers could be reversed without structural change. To recognize the affirmative potential of Walmart is not merely to appreciate its historic originality, its strengths and its accomplishments as an infrastructure of distribution. It is, in Jameson's view, to recognize what Raymond Williams called the emergent as opposed to the residual the shape of a utopian future looming through the mist, which we must seize as an opportunity to exercise the utopian imagination more fully, rather than, a, than an occasion for moralizing judgments or regressive nostalgia. Jameson is not arguing for green or sustainable capitalism as a solution to our problems, and neither am I when I suggest that we might discern 
a similarly utopian potential in the infrastructures of fast food and fossil fuel that Bertinsky invites us to contemplate in the Breezewood photo. Following Jameson's lead, we might imagine the transformation of all those gas stations to electric vehicle charging stations, a change that extended to a national scale would facilitate massive reductions in carbon emissions without having to abandon either the basic infrastructure of individual transportation or the cultural attachment, which is especially strong in the United States, to cars and trucks as both real and symbolic um, vehicles of personal freedom. And we could imagine something similar and far simpler to accomplish with regard to the fast food restaurants in the frame. If gasoline and diesel pumps can be replaced with charging stations, fast food restaurants, if we can even consider such a modest proposal, could be even more easily harnessed to provide, as the food studies scholars Jan Dutkowitz and Gabriel Rosenberg have argued in this article in Wired Magazine, these uh, fast food infrastructures could be harnessed to provide cheap, tasty, and widely available alternatives to meat. The environmental scientist Gidon Eschel has estimated that McDonald's hamburgers account for one third of 1% of all US greenhouse gas emissions. One product, he says, produces all of that. One product served by a single company, he says. I think it's worth pausing and absorbing this. But as we pause and absorb that rather dystopian fact, we can also recognize the ease with which we might reverse the valence of that fact. McDonald's is the world's largest purchaser of beef. And as with Walmart, that scale could just as easily be leveraged in the interest of improving communities and ecosystems rather than destroying them. By replacing animal-based burgers with plant-based burgers, restaurants like McDonald's, the end user interfaces of the vast networked infrastructure of meat could transform the food system. Such a transformation from animal-based to plant-based burgers at the scale of a fast food nation or a pan-global empire of meat there's McDonald's all over Paris, as well as all over America, would in turn affect a substantial reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and yet, despite the introduction of products like the McPlant burger in McDonald's or the Impossible Whopper at Burger King, and this, this is the naked burger that I had in Saint-Germain the other night, the real shift away from animal meat remains all but impossible to imagine. And so I offer the idea of this substitution not as something that I actually think McDonald's is gonna do, right? Because they're not gonna do it. But I offer this idea of the substitution as an exercise in imagining the unimaginable, reawakening, as Jameson says, the imagination of possible and alternate futures. In this regard, I take Duckowitz and Rosenberg who argue for precisely such a transformation of the existing fast food system to a vehicle for plant-based and lab-based uh, and lab-grown meat to be employing utopia as method positing a utopian valence for the dystopia of the present. Extended out to the entire landscape of Bertinsky's Breezewood photo, which incidentally includes a uh, Walmart truck um, inconspicuously disappearing behind the Denny's in the foreground, we can imagine a world that looks exactly like our own, but with an entirely different meaning for both the consumers in the frame and the vast networks of human and non-human life that have conspired to produce it. Such a landscape might provide a more quotidian counterpart to the more charismatic and more conventionally utopian spectacle of wind farms. And this is a wind farm in, in Illinois, um, which uh, the theorist Timothy Morton has suggested that we think of to think of wind farms as environmental art, embodying the aesthetics of an ethical sublime, one that says we humans choose not to use carbon, a choice visible in gigantic turbines. That's all Morton. Unlike the spectacular view of a field of turbines, the choices of electric fuel and plant-based food would be invisible from the highway. They could be right here in this picture, but they would nonetheless signify a similar commitment to a livable future. And I'm highlighting that quotidian nature of these changes as a way of emphasizing that some of the infrastructures of that future are already here. We need only choose what to do with them. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, John uh, Levy. I good thing that McDonald was not one of the sponsors of this conference, yeah. I think. Uh, but um, <laughs> so I'm, um, I'm 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 sure there are questions in the in the room. I think we will we will start with questions here, uh, and then questions via Zoom. Yes. Okay. I need to get the mic. Guillaume Marsh. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering about uh, the use of the singular for meat. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't it be useful to use the term in the plural? Um, I mean, especially when, when thinking of uh, your uh, last suggestions, mm -hmm. um, I mean, isn't the issue more one of the um, um, industrialized um, mass level of production and uh, in terms of meat? Uh, I mean, there are places on this planet where meat is consumed uh, in probably uh, non uh, carbon dioxide, massive carbon dioxide mm -hmm. emitting uh, way. So is, isn't that probably a, a better alternative than, than the mass production of soy, which as far as I know is as destructive of rainforests as the mass production of meat in uh, mm -hmm. South America, for, for example. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, my, my work is definitely a you know a hundred percent focused on on the problems of uh, rich world industrial production. I'm not at all concerned with like small scale like that's because it's a, the it's a, it's sort of ir irrelevant to the climate picture. But um, but the point about soy is an important one to, to bring up um, because the uh, the the cultivation of soy and, and corn which is what is being cultivated uh, both in central Illinois and in the Brazilian Amazon, right? Um, that something like 70% of all of that is being fed to animals, right? So if you cut the animal out of the equation there, you have to, then you have to grow far less corn and soy in order to feed human populations, right? So there's, a, there's an inefficiency that's built into meat production because you have to feed the animals, right? And that's, that's really where the largest impact comes from. Um, it's not so much in transportation, right? It's to inputs to the growing and the, and the habitat change. Uh, the, when you transform a rainforest into a soy field, that's, that's like the worst thing you can do, right? Except for making it directly into a cattle ranch. But they're both sort of equivalent in that you're removing a rainforest and creating a piece of a meat system that, that would not be necessary at all if you were just feeding human beings with the crops that you could be growing on agricultural land instead of feeding those through animals to human beings. So it's really that inefficiency that's the problem. Obviously like, you know, small scale use of animal foods in, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, indigenous communities and, uh, you know, other, you know, that's, that's, Well, I mean, it, it, global north production is, 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 is a problem everywhere. And that efficiency uh, differential is, is a problem for, for everyone who's growing cattle at any scale at all. And some people will say, well, what about grazing and grass feeding? And of course, if you do grass fed uh, and, cow, and cows are the worst, right? Like chickens, I mean, like there's a lot of, you know, degradations in, in what are the, the, the impacts of different kinds of meats. So like chickens that actually have a very low carbon impact compared to meats, they have a much higher impact in other ways, including ethical, if you're concerned about that. Um, but you know, even if you're free ranging cows, it takes so much land out of the picture because they require, because they're just an inefficient animal for producing food. So no matter which way you do it, it winds up with these inefficiencies that are ultimately the problem. Okay, I think there's another question to budge to. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, just a very quick question because you made an allusion to Barclay, to George Barclay, yeah. and then you said you could develop on that. And, yeah. and it's to um, kind of back up in time. Um, it, this talk was part of a larger book. I imagine that you go back in um, history. Uh, would you be able to say more about that, which you alluded to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. The um, so Wallace's story is is titled "Westward the Course of Empire." Is Westward the Course of Empire takes its way. Um, that is a line from the final stanza of the Barclay poem from seventeen 
26, and it was, uh, you know, it's a poem that's about um, uh, colonization as an opportunity for the advancement of civilization and of, and of arts and sciences. Um, and it's, he's talking about on the prospect of planting these things in Bermuda. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, it's very much in the context of, of British, uh, of the British Imperial project at that time. Um, it advances uh, the idea of translatio imperii, the sort of the, the kind of natural progression of, of natural historical project, uh, progression of empires moving um, east to west. You know? Um, you know, for the British imagination, it was Rome to London, London to the New World. And Americans obviously picked up on that in the revolutionary generation to say, well, forget London, right? It's like the capital is now Boston and we're gonna move west. And, um, and so it became, this, this phrase became a, uh, um, a commonplace, a sort of rallying cry in American uh, US um, imperial discourse of the 19th century. So you see this phrase re repeated over and over. Um, uh, it's also the title, it becomes the, Emanuel Leutze, the, 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 the German American painter um, and muralist. He, he's the one with the famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. And he made a famous painting in the in the US Capitol building in one of those stairwells that you might have seen during the you might have seen some rioters running up the um, stairway recently. And there's a huge mural that's called Westward the Course of Empire Takes Its Way. And it and it and it depicts um, you know a wagon train. And uh, and I I actually do a reading of that painting in, in the larger work because um, you know it, what's the, you see all the elements of American Empire, and they include like white people in wagons with guns and they have tons of cows with them. So it's a kind of quintessential image of this kind of, uh, this multi-species invasion that constitutes kind of uh, the westward course of, um, of settlement. Okay, I think we, we still have time for one, or one question. And I can say also, you asked just about the, the larger project. Um, this piece, Cecile was correct. This is the fourth chapter of a book that has six chapters. Um, the first one is like fish and whales. The second one is buffalo and cows. And the third one is like uh, exotic birds and industrial poultry. And uh, this is the follow-up to the article that I published called The Bison and the Cow. And that one really covers this 19th century history of it. So a lot of what I'm doing here kind of refers back to that. So if you want to know more, it's, it's there. Well, I, I, have a sort of, I have a question that may be a little bit too big for now, but I'm just going to ask it. Mm -hmm. So I was struck by a couple of words that you used during your talk. Um, one, one of them is culture, so a neat culture. Mm -hmm. um, the other is story. And I think that you've used a lot of stories to tell us I mean, your argument is based on story to on fiction. Um, and um, the other word is myth. And um, mm. I'm being a little bit provocative here, but um, myth as civilization maybe, and, 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 or, and myth as civilization, a civilization based on freedom. So um, yeah, if, if you can react to, mm -hmm. to this. Yeah, well, so I, I like I like using that culture, the, the term culture, you know, very, very broadly. And I and I am very consciously thinking of the way that Stephanie Lemonager wrote about petroleum culture. Um, for me, that was a very eye-opening book. And it's it's very much always in the back of my mind when I've been structuring this book, because I've been thinking about this whole idea of petroleum. You know, she writes this book called Living Oil, Petroleum Culture in the American Century. And it's and it's about the ways that like oil is like deeply. Um, kind of implicated into like every facet of, of American life. It's not just when you get in your car, you know, it's like like every piece of technology that we're using here, like my, my eyeglasses, you know, the ink on the page here, the, the, the fabric, you know, the, the paving on the roads, like all of it, like it's just oil everywhere. And it also inform, informs certain kinds of aesthetics, right? Like the, the most obvious being like the road novel. Um, but you know the, the fact that the U.S. was designed to be a petroleum country is implicated in like the the these infrastructures of meat production too, right? It's like once once petroleum became like a 
uh, uh, you know, once it became efficient to deliver petroleum into trucks, you could move the slaughterhouses away from the railroads, you know, and like, so, so I said, well, what about, like, what about this, you know, how does, how do we, how does food, you know, function really broadly as a culture, right, and what are our cultures about of, of, of food, and, you know, how are they part of the, you know, kind of invisibly part of the stories that we're telling, both in something like novels or films, but also in like our politics. Um, and I guess, and that, that's, you know, myth is like a particular kind of story, I guess, within that. And, and I think it is a little bit, you know, it's when I'm talking about myth, I guess I'm, I guess stories and myths are, are all part of like ideology broadly, but, um, but I use myth when I want to talk about something that I think of as more like kind of hardcore ideological, like the idea of freedom, you know, like, I, like, I, like my car is an empty, is a representation of my freedom and my hamburger is a representation of my freedom, you know. Um, I don't know if you, you heard, you know, Sebastian Gorka, you know, who's this ridiculous uh, far right Hungarian Trump supporter. <laughs> um, you know, he, he was giving an interview about you know, when the Green New Deal was announced, you know, part elements of the Green New Deal in the U.S. came out, you know, a couple of years ago, and there was some men, you know, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez maybe mentioned something about the possibility that agriculture and changing diets would be important, and you know, the, and the right went went crazy. And of course, it's not just the right. I mean, that's why I'm interested in this stuff too, because like people on the left love meat too. Like this is much. It's not. It's not political. But they attach very much. They they on the right, it's much more strongly attached. To these ideological ideas about freedom, um, I think for like on the left, maybe it's more like aesthetic or something. But on the right, the idea that somebody would come for your hamburger is just as bad as if they were to come for your truck or for your guns, right? So it's like guns, trucks, hamburgers, right? Crosses, flags, arches. You know, it's like these are the these are the symbols of these these myths. Like the the hamburger is like a very very powerful symbol, you know, in this way. I think for in American culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking John Levy Barnett again. Thank you.